welcome. My name is Maria Isabel Gandia. I work at Google Pocket 6 and also at CESUC on behalf of Rediris. Thanks for joining this session. Um, as you know, we did an info share in October and we talked about several things. And there is a growing number of entrants um, offering campus network management as a service. And this also means that they need tools to to do the to monitor the service to manage the network the right tools to manage all the services they offer the gel project in world packet 6 has been working on cinas uh, with the entrants creating a service definition template to be adapted to each case and mapping some architectures and we organized an info share in october and today we're going to to go a little bit into the technical details so all the presentations uh, we have today are come from uh, in one way or another from World Packet 6. And in October, we saw more the background of campus network management as a service, why these entrants that were offering it were, were offering campus network management as a service. Is uh, possible that uh, some everybody is mute? Possible to mute everybody? Ivana, can you? Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So, as I said, in October, we were talking about the background, the challenges and the entrants found, the experiences they had, and the service definition. And today, we're going to talk about tools. Two of these tools, and Mass and Wi-Fi Mon, have been more directly implemented under Work Packet 6, under the Work Packet 6 umbrella. The other two, which are an NMS, NMS and Argus, have been implemented by several entrants, in this case in Uninet and, and Sunet. And today we will see how they can be used when offering CINA services. And more or less, we have this agenda. We have the introduction to campus network management as a service with Lukas Lopatowski from PSNC. He will give an update on NMAS and this tool that contain the tools that contains inside it and that can be used for campus monitoring on the, on the current users. Then we will have two presentations from SUNET. David Heat will do an introduction to their experiences offering SINA services and managing them with the NMS the tool that they have developed at Sunet with zero touch provisioning supported by Jean and Johan Markusson, who will go into the details of NMS uh, with a demonstration of the tool. Then we will do a 10 minutes break. And after the break, we will see Argus, a, a tool that uh, Uninet is developing for consolidating incidents across different network management systems and for managing no notifications. And the last talk by Nikos Kostapoulos will be about Wi-Fi Mon, which is a solution to monitor the Wi-Fi network that can be used for campus network management too. We will also have some minutes at the end of, the, of each presentation for Q&A if necessary, and a final discussion with all the speakers where, where you can also ask your questions. So, okay, let's start. Uh, Lukas Lopatowski from PSNC is our first speaker. He is the team lead for the GM43 for the NMAS uh, tool for the in the GM43 project. So Lucas, the floor is yours. And I stop sharing. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Everything okay. Okay, great. So yes, thank you, Maria, for the introduction. Let me uh, start right away. So hopefully. Most of you already heard about NMAS. It is a basically a marketplace uh, offering network management in the cloud, meaning this is a, a solution that we developed that allows uh, users to simply uh, deploy network management applications within some uh, Kubernetes-based cloud infrastructure. And it is also a production service uh, developed and maintained by the uh, Jean project. Uh, NMAS is offered to all the institutions, all the teams uh, within the, let's say, broad the Jean community, being the um, end end institutions, maybe other uh, Jean project teams, or even end themselves. And of course, it was developed in order to ease uh, network management 
uh, and monitoring software deployment configuration in maintenance uh, so that particular network operators and network administrators do not need to worry about those aspects of running uh, an NMS, uh, but just uh, focus on, on their daily tasks uh, related with monitoring their services. Uh, so we consider that NMAS is uh, very suitable for, for the NMAS, SINAS uh, uh, use case, apologies. Uh, so uh, first it fills the infrastructure gaps observed in the SINAS institutions, uh, meaning that typically an institution does not want to manage uh, or might not have the necessary resources to, to set up and manage an infrastructure on top of which the uh, the NMS applications can be deployed. And in this case, of course, NMS provides the infrastructure, the cloud infrastructure on its own. And of course, um, in some cases, uh, the institutions that want, do not want to manage the, uh, the tools themselves as well, just focus on using them. And in, case, in that case, NMS provides the tools and actually maintains the tools uh, centrally on, on the service side. And on the other hand, um, NMAS is uh, suitable to assist the CNAS operators and managers. And since um, typically if, uh, if an operator may, may be responsible for monitoring and managing multiple networks in multiple institutions uh, with NMAS that supports uh, um, multi-tenancy, uh, all those uh, institutions um, can have their applications deployed on a single NMAS instance. Um, in NMAS, we, we, we introduced uh, uh, the concept of domain being such uh, an isolated environment that can be set up for, for a given customer for to manage, to deploy applications uh, to manage particular network. Um, and of course, uh, on the other hand, the operator may have access to multiple such domains. So he, after logging logging into the NMAS portal, he, he can just switch between the applications deployed for, for multiple customers he is responsible for. So how can you use the NMAS service? And if you can, if you like to only test NMAS itself or test the applications that are currently supported by NMAS, uh, you can use our NMAS um, sandbox instance uh, that is available under this uh, URL. Uh, on this instance, there are no, there is no configuration overhead. Uh, there are already some demo applications deployed, and and the user can deploy his own instances easily. On the other hand, if you would like to deploy actual set of uh, tools for your own uh, for your own needs to monitor some actual network equipment. Uh, you can, of course, use our, uh, our production instance, NMAS instance, uh, on at nmas.eu, which is, of course, uh, more secure than the... I mean, it is secure, unlike the, the Sandbox instance. It is also fully supported uh, by the NMAS team uh, from within the, the Jean project. And the last option is to deploy your own uh, instance of NMAS. Uh, but there are, of course, some prerequisites like, uh, like in the underlying Kubernetes cluster. But if you are interested, of course, I, please visit the, our NMAS installation guide with all the necessary uh, details to, to do that. And actually, we, we already have some, uh, some institutions that, that Try try this uh, this going this path, including the uh, Northwestern University, and um, and Renateris will also look into this. I mean, into deploying their own instance of of NMAS, so that Renater in turn can offer NMAS uh, to uh, to its uh, customers clients directly. And in addition, we are, we will be working on some set of uh, scripts. And that would uh, allow to ease 
this whole process and, and that will allow to uh, in few steps deploy the the whole um, I mean, local version of the Kubernetes cluster and an Nbus instance on top of it. So this is the view of the Nbus portal that is, uh, of course, a web application accessible by, by the web browser. But I hopefully by the end of the, of the time slot, I will be able to do a quick demonstration uh, of how it works. So, so I won't be focusing on it right now. Um, just a couple of sentences regarding the, the deployment process of a, of a new application uh, from the Enmas portal. So, so we wanted to, to make it as easy as possible from the user perspective. So the user has to log into the portal either by uh, typically using his Educane account. Uh, he, he should select an application uh, that is suitable for, to, for his uh, current use case. In this case, I think uh, he, he, he has to simply provide the, the custom name for this instance of Isinga to be deployed and select a particular version of the application. If, uh, if multiple versions of the, applications of, of the application are currently supported by Nmas. And along the installation process, user is requested to, to provide some basic information configuration data, including some uh, some default uh, email address and password for for the administrator user or uh, and or uh, for example um, specify how much uh, storage space should be allocated for this uh, icing instance uh, the, the deployment process typically takes uh, i mean from a couple of minutes to to five ten minutes so it's uh, quite fast and afterwards, user has an act, is provided provided with the access to his own uh, Isinga instance. In this case, uh, under a specific um, URL. So currently, Enmas uh, supports twenty one applications, um, including this is really broad uh, broad scope of, of applications including the very popular ones like, um, for example, Prometheus or Grafana or, or even ELK stack. But we also uh, support and offer such applications like, uh, like Wi-Fi Mon or Persona or uh, SPA inventory that were actually developed within the JAD project as well. And, we, and uh, since, um, and Morton will mention Argus later during this uh, this info share. We are that is worth noting that we also support the NAV application that was developed by uh, by Uninet. Uh, the next tool on the list uh, to be to be integrated is is Routinator. Just to let you know. And of course, new tools can be can be added, and we are enhancing the portfolio with new tools. Uh, continuously. So this is possible, but of course, based on a user request. And if, uh, you know, the, the Enmas team uh, sees some, some added value uh, from it and, and that the new, new tool can benefit um, uh, multiple, multiple users and can uh, serve multiple use cases. There are of course some some prerequisites, like uh, like uh, the the fact that the application has to be packaged as Docker images, uh, but but of course this is a, a common practice these days. Um, once the images are there, we the, the typically the, the provider of the tool of the new application uh, should develop the the so called uh, called Helm chart that allows for for deployment and in, in, in the kubernetes cluster and a, apart from this uh, and must require some some metadata and information about the application itself to be provided so that it can be included in the portfolio and and presented on the on inside the Enmas portal 
So a few words about the current usage of the EMAS service that is uh, run centrally by the, by, and operated by the Jean project. So we have uh, one, 100 users for which we have uh, deployed 20 domains, those isolated environments. Uh, we are supporting 21 applications as it was mentioned before and currently there are 65 instances of applications running. Uh, this is a chart that shows what applications are, are currently running and uh, you can cl clearly see which one of them are the most popular ones. Um, this, at this point, those are uh, the Prometheus and Grafana. And uh, just to mention that, for example, uh, those graphs are taken from, from a Prometheus and Grafana uh, instances that were actually deployed on NMAS itself as well. So just a brief um, look at who is actually using NMAS at this point. Mirko. So, so we have uh, yeah. several NRANs that oh. are using it uh, for in different scopes for different purposes. And Jant itself has a domain set up as well. We have uh, some N institutions, including a very interesting use case of a primary school administrator from Slovenia uh, that contacted us uh, and did set up a domain for his purpose. And now is, uh, he is monitoring several infrastructures of uh, several schools uh, using a set of applications deployed in NMAS. We have also University of Murcia and recently added uh, FAU University from uh, from Germany. We have uh, other joint teams that are also using NMAS and deploy uh, applications that allow to monitor and manage some kind of infrastructures that they have built within their uh, activities. And they were able to simply use NMAS to, uh, to set up the, 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 so the whole monitoring uh, around this without having to do, do it on, on, their selves, on themselves. And of course, NMAS is also suitable for the tool developers that would like to uh, publish the, their, their work on, on NMAS and uh, allow their users or potential users to, to deploy uh, at least some components of their solutions uh, on NMAS. Uh, and not have to burden the, their users with, with that uh, task. So as I said, NMAS supports multi-tenancy on different levels. Uh, of course, we have the, the, the concept of domain that is uh, also included in the NMAS portal, uh, portal in, meaning the user interface. So each domain has uh, has its own users uh, and has its own administrator got, that is um, able to add new users and also deploy applications within this domain. Uh, so the isolation is also uh, enforced on the Kubernetes level within the cluster using the the concept uh, the the using the Kubernetes namespaces, and also is enforced on the network layer with some specific routing and firewall rules. And of course, what I haven't mentioned before, uh, a set of dedicated VPNs that are being um, constructed between the, between the applications deployed uh, in Kubernetes and, and the user premises. I mean, the, the location where, where, the, where, the, uh, where the devices that are being monitored uh, are installed. So this is um, a picture, overview picture of the, of the whole solution. So on the right hand side, we have the Kubernetes cluster with uh, dedicated namespaces uh, created for each of the, each of the domain being the, and domain corresponds to a given user. We also have a, um, a firewall appliance in place. In this case, we have a, uh, software firewall, the, the PFSense, that also terminates the, the uh, VPNs that are, that are created between the, the cluster and, 
and the user networks. So you can see that that uh, actually you can support multiple multiple institutions or NRANs within a single instance of NMOS. Um, and I, of course, I encourage you to, to contact us in case you'd like to monitor your equipment with NMOS or, or share your tool with NMOS and add it to the NMOS portfolio or, or even to test uh, what NMOS offers and uh, how it can be used. And uh, let me quickly switch to uh, a quick demo just to use the, the last couple of minutes I have. So this is basically the landing page of, of the NMAS portal, the, the nmas.eu website. Um, user can log in either using his, his local account, but of course it is preferable to, to use the NetUK account. Um, now I am redirected to, you know, to PSNC IDP. <laughs> okay, this is not good. One second, please. Let's try in incognito mode. Okay, once logged in, user is present, presented with all the applications that are currently supported by, by this particular NMAS instance. Uh, you can see that uh, I'm assigned to a, the PLAB domain. Within the domain, I, I have the right of the administrator so I can see the domain details and also I can view the, the users that are registered to particular domain. I can also view the applications that are subscribed for this domain. So, and those applications can be deployed by uh, by users registered in this domain. And of course, I can also view the uh, the instances of particular applications that are currently deployed. So, in this case, uh, we have a couple of uh, oxidized instances, uh, LibreNMS two Grafana instances and two Prometheus instances. Um, we can also try to deploy a new application, though it will take a bit too much time, but uh, let, let me just show you how this looks like. Uh, so here you see um, a detailed page of one of the applications, in this case, uh, oxidized. So you can see the, the name, the, the versions of the applications that are currently available. Uh, some useful links, screenshots, and a description. Users can also rate the application or, or comment under the application. And if a user clicks deploy, he has to provide a custom name, as I mentioned, select the version, click deploy. The process starts. A user is asked to provide some basic information, some passwords, also some uh, yeah, some IP addresses of the uh, of the tools that should be monitored. Of course in this case we, there is a, some some fake IP address and the the uh, installation process moves forward. Um, once this is done, uh, I will switch to another oxidized demo instance I have created earlier today. Uh, here user can either access the, 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 the application instance, can view the configuration options and the configuration is, is uh, uh, provided via a dedicated Git repository and committing changes to the configuration files. Uh, user can also add members to given uh, instance. Let's try to access this oxidized. Let me provide basic uh, user and name and password. And I'm redirected to the UI of the application. Uh, yes, oxidized is used to backup 
backup configuration of, of, of devices. And this is <laughs> what it actually does. Um, yes, I think that it would be all from my side. I don't want to take too much time. Okay, thank you, Lukas. Okay, and, and we can just see that this instance is already available as well, and we can already access it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I didn't want to catch, to catch you during the, the demo. But uh, thanks. Uh, we will keep the, the questions uh, at the end of the session because uh, now, if, if not, the, the agenda would be complicated. And our next speaker is David Heat. He, he is a product coordinator for Sunnet's efforts in building and maintaining campus network as a service. And he is also in the security center. So David, whenever you want. Yeah, thanks. Um, there is that correct screen. You can see presentation? Yes. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, so I'm coordinating the security and network services at Sunet. And uh, we started out as a project uh, a couple of years ago to establish a campus network as a service with uh, a goal of sharing staff and expertise for the campus networks and the security operations by standardizing both the network architecture and the tools and processes. So a few of the goals uh, were also to do more automation. And that is uh, the primary purpose of uh, this uh, part from us. Uh, Yuan will take this in, in detail. I'm just giving a quick background on our service and scope. So we would no longer need senior network engineers always uh, on site. And we um, are growing this uh, service uh, as we go together with the universities. And it's all open and transparent. And Yuan will probably show uh, quite a lot of links and information on uh, our code base. So this is an invitation for you to continue and collaborate with us. We are primarily using Arista equipment. And uh, together with Uninet, they are using uh, Uniper. But we are looking for support of other brands and vendors as well, such as Cisco. Uh, some of the advantages uh, for the local campus is that we standardize the processes and improve them for multiple campuses. Uh, that results in higher security and repeatable quality. Uh, we didn't start out uh, promising lower total cost of ownership, but uh, I think each of our customers and the ones that we engage see that we can definitely improve both investments and uh, how, how you utilize stuff. And we don't lock uh, the local staff and resources. So the ones that want to grow and, and extend their knowledge in the field can uh, happily do so together with us. But the ones that are stressed and want uh, more, more support from us uh, can also get that. Um, yes, a brief overview of uh, some of the technology advantages uh, with Campus Network as a service that um, we have an existing network operating center that monitors our core network for the research network as a whole. So we are uh, letting them also uh, monitor and create tickets 24 seven on critical events. Um, we have the continuity of uh, the competence where we do things together. We have uh, quite a lot of uh, meetings, webinars, and educational uh, efforts to, to commit uh, knowledge sharing between the organizations. Uh, regarding spare depots, we have a long-term goal that we should utilize this as best we can to have both the equipment that needs to be changed quickly locally and the ones that are very expensive to have uh, regional um, depots to make that efficient so you don't spend so, so much time and energy on having equipment on every site and we're doing these, these procurements in bulk uh, with a centralized supply chain and the maintenance is uh, also fairly streamlined with the lab uh, so we can change and test out variants of firmware before upgrading in, in production at the local campus 
And one of the major things is that we are doing this independently of manufacturers and distributors and partners and integrators and, and whatnot. So we are doing this together uh, with the campuses. So each improvement is uh, shared. And uh, in the Nordics, we are doing a collaboration together with Uninet uh, on using our code bases. So Morten will follow up uh, later on in this webinar on Argus uh, used for making uh, alarm views, uh, but we are also already using NAV to monitor the system. And uh, Uninet is uh, starting to use the network management system that Yuan will, will show. And this is just a reference to uh, another webinar that uh, Magnus, um, our colleague, did and together with Christopher on Perfsonar to monitor local uh, networks with a, with a small node. Um, so it's a, actually it's a tunic power over Ethernet uh, that you can deploy fairly easy for less than 100 euro. So it, it took a bit of tinkering, but uh, I think it is, this is a nice way to show that you can do local monitoring without uh, spending so much um, money and effort on it. And a, a bit of our timeline where we were and where we're going. Um, so in 2019, we did finalize the procurement. It took quite a lot of time to get all the vendors uh, aligned to our uh, wants and needs. Um, we set up a small test lab at Sunet, and we also did um, initial deployment for our first campus. So um, last year we finalized those testing and took that first campus into production and also started uh, on the second campus. And looking forward this year, we are aiming for four to five customers this year, and uh, we are also planning for uh, the new Sunet uh, core network. Yeah, so that was just a short, um, short intro to what we are trying to achieve, uh, and uh, Yuan will go into much more detail now on the technical side of things. Okay, thank you, David. If you want to make any questions, you you can. Feel free to, to put them in the chat. Now, Johan uh, is going to explain in more detail uh, Sina's NMS. Uh, Johan is a network automation engineer working at Sunet, and he is heading the development for Sunet's Sina's NMS. Johan, whenever you want. Yes, thank you. Uh, so again, this will be a more technical demonstration. Uh, I will be showing some different interfaces and how to actually work in this automation system we developed. So I want to show some like common workflows and what it's like to use this system to manage your network on a day-to-day -day basis and hopefully give you an impression of what it's like to, to use it. Um, and maybe you can consider if it's something you could use in your environment. And if you have any questions, please, uh, you can interrupt and ask them as we go along or save it for the end. It's fine either way. Um, so the solution we built is primarily a infrastructure as code solution. So it's similar to what you might have been using for server deployment with uh, Puppet or Chef or something like that. Uh, but we also have some more interactive elements to, to our system. So for example, the zero touch deployments are um, based on uh, new devices booting up on the network and asking for DHCP leases and we will add those devices to the to our database if it's a matching vendor and the main features of our nms system 
are these things you can see at the bottom here. So it's the zero touch of new network equipment, uh, management of configuration for your install base. Uh, and this includes making changes and adding new VLANs and uh, stuff like that. Um, and also firmware upgrades for the network infrastructure. Um, and in our case, uh, Arista won, won the current procurement, but we want to support uh, at least Arista, Juniper and Cisco. So we have uh, several abstractions to be able to support different uh, vendors. Um, and in, in this image, you can see the, the NMS software, which is actually a, like an API server in the middle here. And then we have different interfaces, how to interact with the NMS system. So the infrastructure as code part, that's basically text files, either YAML or Jinja files uh, that you manage in a Git repository. Uh, and then we have a web interface uh, as well as command line interfaces. And if you want to do your own API calls using curl or postman or something, um, and you use these interfaces to like trigger, trigger um, initialization of a new device or pushing a new configuration change or firmware upgrade. Uh, and of course you can integrate your own custom code into this. So it's an open API and we have documentation for how to, how to connect your self-service portal or ticketing system, or if you have any other system you want to integrate in here. We, um, as soon as our universities use many different support systems on their end. So they might use Infoblox for IPAM and we can, we can use different APIs to export or import information here. Uh, and we also have this DHCP lease information that comes from new devices booting up in the network. Um, and those devices are added into the and database in the NMS server. Uh, and you also have a, a firmware repository. Um, and this is uh, a diagram of the network we have in the SUNET lab. So these are mostly Arista switches. We have the core or spine layer here and the distribution or leaf layer. And these two core and distribution layers form a VXLAN fabric in our setup. Uh, but you can use the NMS system for any kind of uh, configuration. It's just depending on what templates you choose to use. Uh, and then you also have an access layer uh, down here that's not part of the VXLAN fabric. It's just regular VLANs. Uh, but uh, we make sure to have all the access equipment connected redundantly so we can upgrade any of the distribution or core devices without having a big impact on the on the users. And that's basically the the only slides I wanted to show, and then I'm going to jump into more of a technical demo. Are there any questions so far? No questions yet, Johan. Yes. Uh, so this is the web interface for the automation system and uh, Here's just a list of the current devices in our lab. Uh, so you can see uh, like the core device, uh, some information and actions you can perform on the devices. 
So you can synchronize the configuration or upgrade firmware, for example. And uh, you can also do these actions on a group of devices. Uh, but the first thing I wanted to show is actually uh, how this zero touch thing works. So we have a device down here that has booted up from like a factory default settings. Uh, so it will ask for a DHCP um, lease and it will download an initial configuration and the DHCP server will actually trigger uh, adding of this device to the database and if we can log in to the device using API uh, and get basic information like serial numbers and models and so on and uh, then we will move this device into the discovered state where you can actually choose to make this a managed device of your network uh, so in this case, I know this device is uh, an access switch. We want to call it A2 for the host name, and it should be of a type uh, access switch. And we can, and this will perform a little check before you start uh, in it. So you can see it's connected to these two switches, which are our two distribution switches. Uh, and that looks okay, it's redundantly connected. So we will start this init process. Uh, and you can follow along in a kind of a log output window here, where it, uh, it actually checks the LLDP neighbors to see how it's connected and what uplinks to use and what physical interfaces are discovered on the device and so on uh, and then we will push a new configuration to this device and that will actually change the management ip and the management vlan and add a lot of configuration um, and since we're changing the management ip we actually lose connectivity to the host for a, for a bit um, and then if everything works correctly we should be able to establish connectivity uh, on the new ip address uh, and this is when you start this job uh, or you start this init process is actually scheduled as a job that's running in the background so even if my web client here or something exits it will still uh, continue with these uh, actions here uh, so now it moved on to the next step in the process uh, and this is where the step two is where it tries to connect using the newly configured management IP address. Uh, yes, and there we were able to log into the device and now it's moved to this state managed which is um, yeah the state we want all the devices to be in when we manage the configuration using the nms uh, but you can also see here there's a little red <laughs> cross that uh, this device is managed but it's not uh, synchronized yet uh, so you can either synchronize the configuration for this specific device uh, or you can go to this config change uh, workflow which is where you do all the uh, all the configuration changes basically um, and as i mentioned before we have um, 
a lot of information like configuration and templates in the Git infrastructure. Uh, so you can ask the API to download the latest changes from Git and uh, deploy changes. Now I haven't done any changes in Git yet, so I just want to synchronize any changes to this new device. And again, this will start uh, a job in the background that logs into the devices and pushes new configuration. Uh, so here you can see the, the uplink devices, the distribution switches. Uh, they actually change the description on the ports going to this new switch. Um, so you get you know, what, what's the expected configuration change here. And you can look through the diff and if you're happy, you can proceed to commit configurations. And the next part I want to show is um, actually changing some of this information in the Git repository. Uh, so this is what we call the settings repository and we have um, different uh, YAML files here where you can configure the settings for the NMS. And this is all managed in Git. Uh, so now, for example, I'm using the VS code editor. Um, and I want to synchronize the changes from Git first. So it will pull any changes from Git. Um, and then I can have a look at the configuration. So this is the VXLAN configurations. Uh, we have some student VLANs here. So if I wanted to create a new student VLAN, I can just copy uh, an existing, it's usually the easiest way, <laughs> and just change uh, some information. I will call it like a student four, or we can call it Xiant. Uh, you have to specify a VNI, which is the, like the VXLAN ID and also a regular VLAN ID for the access switches. Uh, and you have to specify a gateway if you want to have some routing. Uh, and you can specify what group of devices where you want to deploy this VLAN. Uh, so you can commit this uh, to Git and uh, try to do like a dry run on the NMS system. Uh, but you can also perform a, a more basic syntax check of this file before you commit anything. So let's see, for example, I forgot to specify the net mask here. And we have a little plugin in VS Code where you can do a CNOS syntax check. Uh, and it will complain here some validation error on the Xiant IPv4 gateway. Um, so you have to add the the net mask part as well. Mm -hmm. And if we do the syntax check again, it should be a success. Uh, and then I can commit changes in, in VS Code as well.
uh, and in Git you have to commit and then push your changes to the Git repository. And once that is finished, you can go back to this uh, config change page and uh, refresh the settings. Uh, and it should update this latest commit in the settings repository to current time. Uh, and you can perform a dry run to see and what kind of changes this would apply to the network. Uh, you can read through the diff, so it will add the VLAN to some access switches and it will add the VLAN interface on the distribution switches and configure some VXLAN, VNIs and, uh, and so on. And if you're happy, you can confirm the commit again. So that's the basic workflow of making a change. Um, and in the Git repository here, you can do a lot of other things as well. So you can, for example, you can configure the interfaces on the distribution switches. So in this case for the D2 switch, we have a couple of interfaces configured as a downlink. So the, where you connect your access switches and you have some fabric interfaces, which are part of the VXLON fabric. So in our case, this will connect to some core devices um, and the actual link nets and IP addresses and so on will be, um, you don't have to configure it in the settings. It will just use a pool of addresses where, that you specify to build the underlay network for VXLAN, for example. And you can also, do like your own custom configurations uh, where you basically just use your vendor CLI configuration to uh, configure whatever you like. So you might need to connect to some firewall or external internet connectivity. You might need to do some custom configuration for the interface to select the IP address and so on. Um, and you can specify uh, routing neighbors. So you can have static routes or BGP routes or OSPF routes and so on. Uh, and then there's also another Git repository where you do uh, all the template configurations. So for Arista, we have CLI configuration that's specific for Arista and that goes into the uh, Arista or EOS part of the template uh, repository and those are uh, Jinja templates. Uh, so I'm not going to go through uh, the Jinja templates very much, but uh, this is also available on, on GitHub if you want to see our templates and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's like the text files and the web user interface. Uh, and you can also use command line interface. Uh, this is a console access to the switch we actually deployed just before on the A2 switch. Um, but for, for command line uh, access, you can do similar things as the 
web interface, you can like show devices or synchronize configurations and so on. Uh, and you can also do pure API commands using curl. Uh, so for access switches, we actually want to like people in the help desk and um, stuff like that to, to be able to configure access interfaces on the access switches. So those are not managed in the Git, but uh, access interfaces are managed using the API, which means you can have some other like web user interface for configuring access interfaces. Uh, and as soon as we plan to use NAV, the monitoring system, where the help desk can yeah, monitor and troubleshoot the network. And they can also go, go into the port admin and configure ports. Uh, but I'm just going to show some command line API options here. Uh, so we can list the interfaces on this access switch. And these are all configured as auto interfaces by default. Uh, but then we can Uh, send some JSON to the API. Uh, so for example, we can configure a tagged port or a trunk port here. Uh, so we add this new VLAN called Shiant. Uh, so we should be able to configure a port to use that VLAN. Uh, so here I'm using curl to uh, send in this file called trunk.json. Uh, and this is yeah, JSON configuration for how to configure a trunk port. And uh, I have to send some authorization info and so on. Uh, and that VLAN is not available on the switch A2. So we'll have to use some other some other maybe maybe student eleven is available. Yeah, uh, so that's a success for setting uh, student 11 on that port, Ethernet 30. Uh, but we still have to go in and actually uh, apply this configuration. So we, when we call the API, we just update the port in the database uh, and we still have to and do this, uh, synchronize the configuration. Uh, so this is the impact of what we configured. It will remove the auto type, which in our case is some dot one export, and it will uh, add a static VLAN trunk. Uh, yes, and of course the, the custom code, which is basically, you take this same API stuff that we had uh, for curl and you put it in your own code. Um, and the source code for the entire NMS is available on, on GitHub. Um, so we encourage you to, to have a look and uh, see if it's something uh, that you can use. And uh, if you want to deploy it, we have uh, Docker images and a Docker Compose file as well. Uh, it probably helps to have some experience with uh, Git uh, and Docker if you want to deploy it. Um, and if you just want to test it out, you can use, for example, the virtual switches like VEOS. Uh, to set up a, a virtual lab. 
uh, we have more documentation on uh, on the wiki we also have a read the docs site uh, for uh, like the actual product documentation and the API reference and the, uh, what you can configure in the Git repository and so on. Uh, so you can see how to query jobs and uh, stuff like that. Yes, and uh, you can reach me by mail or this, uh, we have this NREN Slack where you, there's both a CNAS channel or the automation channel. Uh, let's see, are there any questions? Yeah, you had one on the chat there. Which tool is used to connect the devices and deploy in the configs? Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. Dennis is answering here. It's uh, Nornir is like the main framework uh, at a higher level, and then Nornir in turn uses Napalm for configuring devices. Uh, but you could also, in Nornir, choose to use uh, like pure netconf or something uh, if you don't want to use Napalm. So we should have it should be possible to support uh, a lot of different vendors here. Uh, but for Napalm, it's mainly focused on Cisco, Juniper, and uh, Arista. Okay. Yes, and we have some Paramico hacks for, for the firmware, firmware upgrade. I didn't really show much about the firmware upgrade. It takes some time to do a firmware upgrade, but you can um, go into a group of devices um, and select the firmware to download and activate on the device. And then as a second step, you actually do the reboot or schedule a reboot for when you want to deploy the, the new firmware. Yeah, I think that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Johan. Thank you, everybody. And we were we're going to do a 10 minutes break now, and we will be back in 10 minutes with the second part with Argus and Wi-Fi Mon. Thank you. Okay, so we're here again, starting with the second session. Our next speaker is going to speak about Argus. He is Morten Breckebel. He is a senior software engineer working on developing network management open source software. Morten is the main developer of NAP, uh, the Network Administration Visualize. And he is also heading the development of the aggregated alert system Argus, which is talking about now. Morten, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. <clears throat> So, um, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I just needed that confirmation. So, uh, I'm Morten. Uh, I'm from Uninet, uh, and I'm here to talk about how we are handling alerts from the ever increasing number of monitoring systems at Uninet. Uh, I would have liked to do some live demos just like Johan, but unfortunately, we don't have a lab version running that can guarantee that we don't divulge any sensitive information. So there will be mostly be screenshots. So very early on in our concept for campus network as a service, we knew that the one requirement was for the customer to have access to their own monitoring data and even to be able to make small configuration changes to access ports if need be. Something Johan mentioned in his talk. <clears throat> Uh, our network monitoring solution of choice for CNAS is our own NAV software, which already allows for this. Uh, but uh, NAV, like many such software packages uh, we use, is not designed to be multi-tenant. So we quickly realized that we would need one NAV instance for each customer. And 
this also led to the realization that once we have 10 customers, we will have 10 now instances to manage. Uh, so managing the, insta the instances themselves is not a big problem, but how will we manage all the alerts coming from all these instances? Uh, each NAV instance has its own alert dashboard and its own notification profile configuration. So surely we cannot expect our service center or NOC to have one NAV dashboard for each customer. This would correspond to one physical screen in the NOC for each customer. This becomes unwieldy pretty quickly. So the first idea we had was to reuse NAV's existing functionality for processing events, alerts, and notifications. But even though we have successfully integrated some third-party software like Zymon uh, or NFSEN into NAV's event queue, NAV isn't really designed to handle external events and alerts. And also, the alert profile configuration in NAV is notoriously cumbersome for end users to manage. So uh, we've actually had uh, separate uh, tutorials and workshops just to teach people how to do this. So, <clears throat> we decided that we need something new, something that has the single purpose of consolidating alerts from multiple systems and provide our service center with the necessary functionality to handle incidents across our entire service portfolio. So for this express purpose, we built IGUS. And uh, version one of Argus has actually been running in production at Uninet since just before Christmas. Argus at its core is a RESTful API for uh, over a database that stores incident information from multiple source systems. So the term incident here has been loosely stolen from the ITIL concept of incidents. Uh, each instance of a monitoring service is known as a source system in IGUS. So for each NAV instance, uh, we have there is a potential source system for IGUS. Subix is another potential source system for IGUS at UNET, since we use it for service monitoring. And at SUNET, Nagios is a potential source system for IGUS. But how do we get these systems to talk to IGUS? Uh, this is where we introduce the concept of a glue service. So uh, a glue service is something you need for each source type of source system that you have. Uh, it's any kind of software that uh, acts as an Argus API client and translates alerts from a source system into an Argus incident. Um, and the glue service is also responsible for closing incidents in Argus once the source system closes them. So basically, Argus doesn't have any special knowledge of the source systems that provide the incidents. It just expects incidents to be delivered to it in the format it expects on the API. <clears throat> uh, the Argus user interface is also just an API client for end users to interact with. Uh, so they can use this to both browse the incidents, filter the list of open incidents, look at uh, at uh, historic incidents, and to also configure their own personal notification profiles. And uh, any other type of API client for Argus is also feasible. Uh, <clears throat> one such idea is what we call an agent, something that uh, goes into Argus, examines the existing open incidents, and adds information to them, or even links the incidents together based on knowledge from other systems like our con the configuration management database or inventory systems, things like that. Um, a much simpler example is one that is operational at Uninet at the moment is just a simple email report of the last 24 hours of incidents that have not been acknowledged by the service center yet. <clears throat> so this is the main dashboard of an Argus instance. Uh, when you log into Argus, this is the first page you see. And of course, uh, Argus supports federated login through FEDA, the Norwegian IDP, uh, uh, using OAuth. So this mechanism should be adapted to support things like EduGain or other national IDPs. This uh, screenshot shows the listing of unresolved incidents that match selected filter. So I have um, 
a filter here that is uh, preset for me. It's called CNAS, and it basically uh, filters any incident that is open. Uh, it doesn't matter whether the incident has been acknowledged by someone or not, so it includes both. And it only includes incidents that are tagged with uh, a service name of Campus CNAS. So this base dashboard only shows events from CNAS systems, not from, uh, for example, the research network or anything else. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, at, at any time, I can play around with these filters in the, in the interface here. I can uh, select specific sources, look at closed incidents or both closed and open incidents, only acknowledged or unacknowledged incidents. Uh, also change the tags with auto-completion so I can filter on other types of tags. I can use this to, for example, filter incidents related to a specific uh, customer or a specific device or host name. And uh, at any time I can, uh, when I have changed this filter, I can save it back to this preset name or I can create a new filter a preset with another name. Uh, so if we click on one of those uh, uh, incidents in the list, uh, we see uh, all the details related to it. So we can see that this incident is open. Uh, it has been acknowledged. And we can see the list of acknowledgements here. So uh, this is a person who works at the UNINET Service Center. He has just simply acknowledged it that they are working on it and inserted a ticket number here. And you can also see that the uh, incident has been tagged with an actual uh, link to our ticketing system. So if you click this, you will be taken to the ticket case in our request tracker. And the uh, uh, at the moment, we don't support an integration with the ticket tracker. This is something that's on our roadmap. So it only supports taking a, a URL to a ticket. So they basically create the ticket in the request tracker and paste the link to the ticket back into this incident. You can see all the tags for the incident here, the type of event uh, in the source system here. Uh, you can see here that the, the source is uh, a, a NAV installation uh, for a customer called UNIT. Uh, it's also tagged with the customer name here or the customer identification. So it's, this is the host name, the room where the host is located and the location where this room is located and so forth and the customer service tag again. So these tags are all tags that uh, uh, give you information about what's known from the source system about this alert. And uh, which tags are added is basically up to the glue service itself. So the glue service for now will, uh, will pull out information that is interesting to put into Argus and put it in the incident. <clears throat> so you can see when the incident started and uh, what the duration of the incident is. This is uh, still open, so the, the screenshot is old, so it's even older than eight months now. Um, and there is also a, a history of changes or events related to this incident. So not much has happened with this. It was reported by this user or this source system at this point in time, and this description was given. So um, I can also here manually close the incident, which will also uh, uh, put in a new log entry here, which user actually closed the incident. Uh, If we move on, uh, you can build multiple incident filters. Uh, you can test them and name them and save them from the dashboard, as I mentioned previously. But in the notifications menu, users can define their own personal notification uh, uh, profiles. So they can uh, define their own subscriptions to receive the desired notifications via selected media, such as email or SMS, which are the currently supported media. And we also plan to support Slack and Teams, which is uh, something we have been using at Unnet. Um, so uh, basically here you select a time slot. So I will show you the time slot definitions. Um, this tells me at which point in time I want to receive alerts. This pre takes one of the preset filters and selects those for inclusion. And I select the media and the, a phone number if applicable. Um, 
this is the some of examples of a time slot definition. So you have a, a time slot here that defines basically 24 seven time periods. So if I use this, then I will be alerted whatever matches my filter all day round and all week round. Uh, I also have a time slot here defined as uh, or named as working hours, which basically just defines uh, 0800 to 1600 hours, Monday through Friday. So useful for working hours. And also if you have an uh, on-call duty person, someone with a pager or, or mobile phone to receive alerts outside of working hours, you would define a slot for outside working hours. <clears throat> um, the incident model in IGUS also supports uh, relating alerts to each other. Um, uh, the model supports it, but the user interface doesn't support the concept yet. So we, we are uh, uh, going to implement this. Um, as incidents may be related somehow. Um, for example, uh, sometimes you will see that you get 100 incidents due to the same root cause, for example, a power outage. Sometimes the source system just can't help but create 100 incidents for this. So one thing this could be used for is to actually mark all these 100 incidents as having the same root cause. And the plan is to that this would then be collapsed into just one line in the, in the user interface so that you can uh, operate on these incidents in the group. Um, <clears throat> You could also say that uh, two incidents basically are the same. Sometimes you will have multiple source systems that are monitoring the same aspect of a, of a, a service. So they might actually report the same thing. So you could link these two together to make sort of a pseudo incident for, for cover, covering all the source systems. Um, you could also, if you have an agent that knows how your services or your service portfolio is structured, your network is structured, it could go in and examine the list of incidents and figure out that, okay, this incident is likely caused by this other incidents and link those incidents in that way. Um, also, uh, the plan is to be able to add these uh, relations between incidents manually so that uh, if the operator or the person at the knock has some, some knowledge that cannot be automatically derived, he can just click a bunch of incidents and say, these are related for some reason. Um, so a little bit about uh, the current status of Argus development. Uh, so I already mentioned it's being used in production at Uninet currently have uh, four uh, CNAS customers in operation and we have more incoming customers. So we are already uh, getting a, a, a lot of use of it. Um, we are currently in the process also of writing glue services for, for Zabbix, which we use for service monitoring in uh, Uninet. We do not use it specifically for CNAS yet, but we use it for all kinds of services that aren't necessarily related to network infrastructure. Uh, and we also have a tool that we use to monitor the research network called Zeno, something I think only Uninet and Nordinet uses. It's an old tool written at Uninet. Um, so uh, we have basically been trying to outsource the glue service authoring to other Uninet departments to facilitate sort of the feeling of ownership throughout the organization. So the platform department who is responsible for Zabbix, they are writing a, a glue service for Zabbix. Uh, the, the research network department, they are working on writing a glue service for Zeno. Um, <clears throat> we are also currently testing glue services for two uh, uh, cloud-based Wi-Fi services that we are using in CNAS. Uh, so for deploying Wi-Fi at CNAS customers, we have two uh, cloud-based control planes, one for um, called MIST, which is Juniper's cloud-based uh, control plane, and we have something called Aruba Mobility Master, which is the same thing for Aruba. So these, these have also have APIs to get information out of them, and they also support webhooks to report alerts. So we are currently testing uh, uh, glue services that will 
take any alerts from these systems and also post them into IDUS. Uh, and for all these glue services that we are developing at UNINET now, we use um, uh, a Python API library, which we wrote ourselves so that we can have a common code base to access the API. Uh, and I recommend anyone who wants to write a glue service and who is who knows Python well should use this library. Uh, <clears throat> if I have some minutes to spare afterwards, I might show you some usage examples of the library. Um, so going forward, um, we have implemented severity levels in the backend database. This was something that was missing from version 1.0. Uh, severity is a very important concept to be able to filter out the important incidents from the less important ones, uh, especially for uh, the, the service center has some idea or some uh, service level agreements to what they need to actually react to. But our second line of support may be interested in the lesser important events that the USC doesn't need to react to. So one primary way of filtering this would be using a severity level. <clears throat> but uh, the front end still lacks this concept. So, so the front end needs to be updated. Um, you're also not entirely satisfied with how the filter implementation works. So we are, are working on, on new concepts for, for rewriting it. Um, and that includes the notification implementation uh, so that it would be easier to write plugins for, for example, Slack and Teams, which I mentioned. Um, and uh, also actual integration with our ticketing system. So we use Request Tracker at Uninet. So we would like uh, a button that basically takes an incident and posts, posts the details into a new request ticker ticket uh, and then gets the URL back and then relates it to the incident. Um, and of course, not everyone uses uh, request tracker, so this needs to be pluggable somehow so that uh, other requests uh, or ticketing systems can be supported. And of course, there's also much work uh, goes into deciding how to map things into incidents from source systems. Uh, for example, things that are defined to be on maintenance in NAV should in, in, uh, these things be reported as incidents when these devices go down, or should they just be kept in now? <clears throat> so uh, at the moment, we have decided basically everything that happens during a defined maintenance period should not be shipped to Argus at all. So this is something that should be configurable in the, in the glue service. Basically. So uh, Argus is free software. Um, the development is supported by Giant, of course. This is why we are here today. Uh, so you can try it out. You can even contribute if you like. And uh, if you have any questions, you can get in touch with us by using this email address for basically any open source tool published by Uninet. And uh, I have some references on my last slide here. So either take a screenshot now or download the slides later. Thank you. Thank you, Morten. The slides are all in the in the event page. So anyone who wants to follow the presentations, the, you can find the slides in the in the agenda. Okay, thank you very much, Morten. I think we're moving to our last speaker, and then if we have questions, we can do them at the end. Our next speaker is Nikos Kostopoulos. Uh, Nikos is a PhD student at NTUA and Chris, and he is also working at the GM project uh, in the, on behalf of GRNet. He's developing Wi-Fi mode. He's one of the developers, and he's going to explain how we can use that for campus network management as a service. Nikos? Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I cannot see slides yet. Okay. Now you can see them, I think. Yes, perfectly. Thank you. OK, hello, everyone. I'm Nikos. Uh, I'm PC student at Greece, and I will present you Wi-Fi mode, which is the service of uh, Giant uh, from, uh, since uh, 2020. First, what is Wi-Fi mode? Introduction. Wi-Fi mode is a system that monitors the performance of Wi-Fi networks as experienced by their end users. To do this, it follows an objective quality of experience approach. One more thing that WFM on, uh, is based on is that it combines these crowdsourced measurements collected from end users and hardware probe measurements collected from fixed from uh, devices that are located in fixed points within the network 
in order to provide complete insight into why Final Tour performance. And optionally, in an IEEE 802.1x network, such as Edroom, you can uh, incorporate data from Redius and DHP logs that are available in order to provide more, uh, to provide richer analysis. For example, you could uh, visualize throughput per access point within the network and uh, uh, find uh, what uh, access points are prob problematic in uh, our malfunctioning in your network. And uh, although it could, it could be applied in uh, various uh, various organizations. Sorry, Nikos, is... I'm sorry to interrupt you. Is it normal that we still see your first slide? It says WFM on introduction, right? Mm, no, it's, no. The, it's the, the first page. We're seeing, okay, now we see the Wi-Fi on introduction. Thank you. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Then you, you lost everything, right? Let me let me sum up what I said. Uh, Wi-Fi Mon is, is a tool that monitors performance of Wi-Fi networks, and to do that, it uh, it monitors the experience of uh, the end users via an objective quality of experience approach. And uh, the main thing is that it combines two kinds of measurements: crowdsourced and hardware broad ones. Crowdsourced are uh, uh, come from end users that roam the network and hardware probe measurements come from, from devices that are placed in fixed points in the network. And it, uh, it is uh, extremely suitable for campus networks because there you have all the information uh, that you need in one place, but it could also be applied in, uh, in other, uh, other organizations or uh, home networks, also in conference venues. And uh, optionally in uh, edge room or other uh, authenticated uh, networks, you could incorporate data from radius and DHCP logs to provide stronger analysis, for example, throughput per access point in the network. And, uh, and uh, uh, co comp compared to other monitoring uh, solutions, WFMO have some, uh, uh, some very special uh, characteristics is that it monitors from the end user perspective, it focuses uh, on the experience of the end user. Uh, it does not require end user intervention. For example, it does not require an end user to, to press a button in order to trigger a measurement. The measurements are triggered automatically. And uh, to, it, does not need the it does not require the installation of an app. You will see later how. And it provides a centralized view by combining all the results in a centralized platform and informs the Wi-Fi administrator and not uh, the end user only, such as uh, some, uh, some, some te test tools uh, like uh, speed test. Okay, going on. You can see the next slide, right? Um, I see just the introduction slide and then the title of the architecture one below. Probably, well, let me cut the video because it is. Ah. Now you see the architecture one. Now we have the architecture in the okay. screen. Sorry, my my connection is very is very poor. Don't worry. So this is the main architecture of Wi-Fi Mon. Wi-Fi Mon includes uh, main four main components: the software probes, the hardware probes, the test server, and the analysis server. So initially, the the sources of the monitoring data are the Wi-Fi Mon software probes which model the end users, for example, laptops or mobile phones. And uh, the second source are the hardware probes that monitor the, these, these, uh, these devices that are placed in fixed points within the network. Moreover, in uh, Edroom or other uh, authenticated networks, you can uh, get information from Radius and its server that are extra extracted by them using a file bit agent and are streamed in Wi-Fi on analysis server, which is the core monitoring and processing component of, uh, of the Wi-Fi Mon architecture. This component, the Wi-Fi Mon analysis server, collects the results, processes them, and provides visualizations to, uh, to the Wi-Fi Mon administrator. And uh, when, when, uh, when a device, uh, when, when a device visits the, the, technolo the technology behind, behind Wi-Fi Mon is that when a device, either a software probe or a hardware probe, visits a monitor website, the monitor website is a website that uh, is uh, is uh, in which we have embedded some uh, some uh, appropriate lines in order to trigger measurements. When when the device visits this monitor website, it fetches some HTML code and triggers some performance test against the Wi-Fi Mon test uh, server, which is the the, monitor, the component that uh, holds the test data and the code uh, that is uh, appropriate for uh, the the measurements. The
then this device is download this test data, which can be some uh, small garbage data or, or some small images from the Wi-Fi on the server, calculate the performance results, and stream them to Wi-Fi on analysis server for processing. Let's go on. Could, can you see the, this next slide? Not yet. Mm. This is bad. It takes a while from, from, from one to another. Do you want to stop sharing and start sharing again to see if it... Okay. Or maybe some of us can share if you want, Nikos. Yes, Nikos, if you want. Could you uh, please? Yes, Could sure. Could you please, if you have a stronger connection. I'm on an, 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 an Ethernet cable and yes, no I still problem. have problems. No problem. I can share the screen and then you can just let me know when you want to change from okay, one okay. to another, okay? Thank you. No problem. Uh, let me share it. And do you see it? No. Now? Yes. Uh, it's, uh, it's loading. Yes, I can see. OK. Whenever you need to change the slide, just let me know and I will change it. OK, thank you. So uh, one of the main components is the Wi-Fi Monte server which holds the code and test data that are required for performance measurements. And it is based on uh, JavaScript technology. We embed some HTML lines in a frequently visited website. For example, in a within a university, this could be the, uh, the, the main website of, uh, of uh, the university. And when uh, upon visiting this, uh, this site, uh, the end device is downloads, fetch some uh, test data, calculate the results, and stream them uh, for processing. A Wi-Fi mode currently uses three test tools, NetTest, Boomerang, which is developed by Akamai, and Speeded, which is developed by Liberspeed. And uh, one very important restriction about the Wi-Fi mode test server is its, pla is its placement. Uh, be uh, the Wi-Fi mode test server should be placed as close as possible to the monitor networks in order to minimize the distance between the monitors and devices and the test server in order to reduce the accurate loss. Otherwise, you would see the effects of the round trip time in the measurements. However, even if this is not possible, Wi-Fi is a tool that uh, focuses on, the, on capturing the relative changes among received measurements. Even if the test server is placed far away, you would see that there is, for example, a, a throughput drop. You, you may not be ex exactly interested on the specific, a specific value, for example, that the download throughput is uh, those uh, kilo BPSs, but you you are uh, you will see that uh, at this moment, at this specific moment of time, and at this particular access point, there was a throughput drop. And for example, you should take some action. Could you go on, please? Okay. And as mentioned before, the software probes are end-user devices, the devices of uh, that uh, roam the network, and uh, we want to capture. Uh, the experience of the end user. It could be laptops, smartphones, or any other Wi-Fi enabled uh, devices. And uh, this, uh, the measurements originating from these devices are called crowdsourced and uh, are triggered uh, when the user visits the Wi-Fi enabled website. Uh, the important thing here is that uh, these measurements are not triggered by end users themselves, but they're triggered autom automatically upon visiting this website. And another advantage of Wi-Fi Mon is that the uh, additional software is not required to be installed or end user devices. And uh, we have some, uh, we have some, uh, we have included in Wi-Fi Mon uh, some uh, parameters in order to, uh, to 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 not overload the analysis components and the test server. For example, there is a subnet. Uh, there is, uh, you can see here, you can see in the polling. Uh, some lines that should be injected in this uh, popular website. And uh, you have uh, two things. You have a, a subnet, which is used to exclude uh, other segments within the network that uh, visit this, uh, uh, this, uh, this common, uh, this frequently visited website. For example, uh, if you inject these lines in, uh, in a frequently visited website, uh, you could uh, 
you have users visiting this website both from the Wi-Fi and from uh, some other uh, segments outside the network. So uh, this measurement, this uh, subnet parameter, uh, helps you to avoid excessive measurements, to avoid measurements that are not uh, uh, that are not uh, relevant to your uh, to your monitoring. Uh, next, please. And uh, hardware probes are uh, devices that uh, are used to measure Wi-Fi performance from fixed points within the network. And uh, their purpose is to complement crowdsource measurements by providing a baseline throughput in order to compare them. Uh, the measurement technology is very similar to the software probes, and it's based on a cron tab that you could see uh, in, in this slide. For example, you trigger on predefined periods, you automatic, you trick the cron tab automatically triggers some performance test against the Wi-Fi the server. Apart from this information, this performance information, the hardware probes collect additional data about the monitor, the SSID, and the nearby SSIDs. For example, the access point, signal strength, link quality, bit rate, or transmission power. And uh, in Wi-Fi mode, we currently experiment with uh, Raspberry Pis but uh, this technology could be generalized in any small four-factor device. Next, please. Okay, the Wi-Fi on L server is the core processing and monitoring component of uh, Wi-Fi MON. You can see that it has two modules, the Wi-Fi on agent that collects and processes monitoring data, and the Wi-Fi on UI that uh, gets the processed results and provides visualizations to the Wi-Fi MON administrator. So uh, the, the analysis server collects results uh, from uh, performance measurements. This could be the, uh, the, the metrics from uh, the Raspberry Pis, the performance measurements from, um, from the hardware probes or the software probes, and correlate this information with accounting data from radius and DHP logs. This information is stored in uh, an ELK cl el cluster in Elasticsearch, and Kuban is used to provide visualizations to the Wi-Fi MON user interface. Next, please. Okay, this is uh, this, this is a, a, this is an image from uh, the Wi-Fi MON user interface. You can see here results from three hardware probes uh, that are multiplexed in uh, this uh, uh, in these uh, charts. On the left, you can see you can see from uh, you can see the measurements of the three individual probes. And on the right, you can see these measurements averaged for all uh, aggregated for all uh, probes. Next, please. Okay, and an important aspect of Wi-Fi mode is the correlation with radius and DHCP logs, which is uh, used in order to enhance the, the results that you receive. For example, to enable correlation per access point within the network and detect underperforming uh, underperforming uh, access points in your network. The logs are extracted from radius and DHCP servers using FileBit. They are processed and transferred by Logstas in the Wi-Fi analysis server, and they are stored in Elasticsearch of uh, the analysis server. There are two correlation options. The first one is uh, done with the end user IP address, and it is only based on radius logs. But unfortunately, uh, this, uh, this correlation uh, uses uh, a field that's called framed IP address, which is not always present in radius logs. So you, we also support the second correlation option, which is with the end user MAC address, which is based both on radius and DHCP logs. For example, uh, you first use the DHCP logs to find uh, the connection between uh, the, the assignment between the IP address and the MAC address, the IP address that you see in the performance measurement, and uh, to, to find the corresponding MAC address, and correlate based on this MAC address that's included in the radius logs. And uh, one very important part uh, here is that the sensitive data, uh, for example, IP and MAC addresses of end users, are secured in transient using a TLS encrypted channel and stored hash in the Wi-Fi on analysis server. And this is done based on the XPAC Elastic extension. Uh, and of course, correlation comparisons, uh, because everything is uh, stored uh, hashed, correlation comparisons are performed directly on hash strings. Next, please. There are two. Uh, for, uh, let me first start by saying that uh, Wi-Fi MON is a giant service since 2020, and there are two options to install Wi-Fi MON. Uh, the first option is that uh, interested institutions install all the components on their premises. This means that uh, all data stay within the premises of the institution, and the Wi-Fi MON team supports uh, the, the whole process of installing uh, all the components of uh, Wi-Fi MON. And as mentioned before by Lucas, 
The second option is to use Nmans, which is uh, more appropriate for testing or trying Wi-Fi mode. But uh, beware, uh, the Wi-Fi on the server is not supported by Nmans because, as mentioned before, it should be placed as close as possible to the monitored uh, network. And uh, one, uh, one thing that we're working on uh, right now, it is an Ansible script for, automa for automating the Wi-Fi on analysis server installation, which, is the, which corresponds to the first uh, option. Next, please. I think it, is, will, it will be very soon uh, released. Now let's see some results from evaluation. Uh, this evaluation uh, includes uh, our pilot in the Jean Potion 2020 in Ljubljana. There we monitored around 250 participants. We focused on the endroom and we used seven uh, Raspberry Pi as hardware pros with a measurement interval of five minutes. Apart from, them, we, apart from that, we also included software pros, meaning that we monitored the end user within the conference venue by including the necessary HTTP lines in a popular, uh, a frequently visited website, the conference agenda. And if you, if, uh, if you remember uh, when you registered in the, the symposium, you had to provide consent during the online registration process. And the test server was placed uh, extremely close in Arnes. Next, please. OK. These are some results from the crowds of measurements during the first day of the conference. Specifically, they depict the average download throughput. And uh, you can see that, uh, remember that crowdsource measurements are those collected from the end users within the venue. You can see that uh, corresponding to the circle with number one, there are some major drops between 11 and 11.40 and uh, 15.30, 16. Uh, these are periods that uh, follow the coffee break and presumably more people were visiting a symposium agenda at that uh, moment. Uh, presumably uh, overloading some, uh, some uh, specific uh, access points that were uh, close to the, uh, to the room uh, that served coffee and uh, lunch. Then in, uh, in two, you can see a notable drop between 12.30 and uh, 14 during and after last time when most participants gathered less space. And three, you can see that the, in three, you can see that the average total of throughput was restored. We can see higher levels when uh, participants were distributed across uh, different uh, rooms within the venue, and presumably they overloaded less uh, access points. Next, please. Uh, okay, this, these results are, uh, are the results collected from hardware probes at the, at, the, uh, at, at, the, at the same time interval as the crowds of measurements. And you can see that both hardware probes follow similar trends, but also that they concede the throughput drops reported by the software probe measurements. If you remember the previous slide, these uh, lines uh, are uh, almost uh, are, are very are extremely similar. And uh, one question that we received uh, in uh, in our earlier presentations was that uh, the average amount of throughput was less than those of uh, of uh, the crowdsource measurements. This was because we placed hardware probes at the floor in order to, or uh, a way of access points in order to find uh, the necessary power plugs that were available in the conference venue. Next, please. And here are some, uh, some results from the wireless network metrics. Recall, please, that uh, I mentioned hardware probes, apart from uh, performance measurements, they also collect some metrics regarding signal level, bitrate, link quality, et cetera, et cetera, from, uh, uh, about the SSID and nearby SSIDs. And you can see here the average levels of uh, these values collected by each hardware probe. One, and uh, on the right, you can see the dual on throughput, upload throughput, and pink, la pink latency reported by these probes. What is uh, uh, very intriguing here is that uh, you can see hardware probe one reported the average link quality, but uh, uh, the throughput results that it reported were among the worst. Likewise, the, hardware, the fifth hardware probe reported the worst average link quality, but uh, the, the, each throughput results were among the best. So we conclude from that that uh, these metrics are not, uh, are not suitable to fully uh, report on the performance of a Wi-Fi network, and it is essential to also include the crowdsource and probe measurements that we saw earlier. Next, please. Okay, and this is a very uh, recent result from a home network. You can see that uh, Wi-Fi Mon, uh, this is a, a measurement from a hardware probe. You can see that Wi-Fi Mon uh, 
throughput drops. For example, you can see a throughput drop here when I downloaded some, uh, some big files uh, within a home network. Next, please. And the future steps of Wi Fi Mon is that we want to enrich the Wi Fi Mon toolset with additional Wi Fi performance monitoring options, apart from the three test tools that I mentioned NetTest, Boomerang, and SpeedTest, contact interest in rents and assisting them in installing Wi Fi Mon. Recently, we supported a setup in uh, Renu, the Ugandan uh, NREN. Uh, we are currently working on setups in home enterprise networks of uh, Wi Fi Mon team members. Uh, we have setups in NQA in Greece. Uh, RAS in Albania, Grena, and the uh, University of Belgrade. And uh, a feature that uh, will be soon uh, released is version tracking for Wi-Fi Mon. For example, Wi-Fi Mon users will be able to check if there is a new version of the code that's currently not supported and causes uh, extreme confusion uh, among users. Next, please. OK, and uh, some uh, very interesting clicks here. You can check out the Wi-Fi Mon video in the first link, the Wi-Fi Mon info share in the second link, and earlier presentations in the third link. Uh, apart from that, uh, I couldn't uh, include it because it was uh, published uh, officially today. There is, a, uh, there is a recent paper about Wi-Fi Mon that you could uh, uh, try to find in uh, Scholar, and I will uh, very soon include it in, uh, in the presentation section of uh, Wi-Fi Mon. Next, please. And thank you. And if you want, you can visit the homepage of Wi-Fi Mon or ask questions in uh, the Wi-Fi Mon operations mailing list. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria, for... Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikos. Uh, okay, I see we have a couple of questions already in the chat. Franz asks, how can Wi-Fi Mon resolve which access points a client uses? Need it to pinpoint the location where performance does not reach a required threshold level? You can get the MAC address of the access point. The Wi-Fi Mon collects the MAC addresses of, uh, of access points via the radius load. I, I think this answers the question, right? Yes, in case. And, uh, OK, we have another question. Yes, Robert asks, are the measurements dependent on types uh, and configurations of APs, for example, the device manufacturer, the transmitting power, and etc. No. OK. Quick answer, <laughs> short answer, no. OK, any other questions for Nikos? Anyone from the participants? You can raise your hand or just jump in. OK, so this. Uh, goes to the to the discussion moment where you can ask whatever you want to the speakers or you can share your own experiences or your own questions in your particular case any questions for that or any comments okay i will go then with a with a question for morton you mentioned you you had argus and you were like trying to to have a, you foresee many functionalities in the future morton you said that you were you wanted to to link with the ticketing system and and give a lot of, of new functionalities how do you foresee this uh, timeline for this uh, development in the in the tool well, uh, firstly, we are working on getting the actual severity uh, function into the user interface and um, being able to filter on that in notification profiles. And um, it's a bit unclear to me. We are we are uh, really wanting to let our service center prioritize which features go in first. But they have not indicated any priority yet for uh, whether uh, we should uh, improve notification profiles first or start working on uh, uh, integrating um, ticketing systems. <clears throat> so it's for us now, it's really up to them unless we get loads of requests from, uh, from the rest of Giant. Thank you, Martin. And this could be also a question for the rest of the speakers. How is the software you are developing now? Is it something that you feel that it's just in the maintenance, uh, in the maintenance, regular maintenance uh, 
time of the tool or are you trying to develop much more things? I know that David said that you are just working with Arista and you're trying to work with Cisco. If you get any volunteers, how do you foresee this? Do you want to start, Lukash? Sorry, I must not, maybe not, I didn't understand the question, but uh, it was uh, about at which stage of development is uh, this. Yeah, well, so Enmas is actually in, let's say in production for, uh, I think for over a couple of years now, uh, though this team is uh, the team around it is still here. So we are continually doing continuous uh, development and adding improvements, enhancements, and uh, some some maybe some new features based on user request. Also, we are keep adding. I mean, we are for now we we kept adding new applications to the portfolio, so that it is. Uh, as appealing to to the users as possible, but maybe at at some point we'll have to, I mean, uh, cut some applications because the maintaining all of them might be a huge effort. And yes, and of course we are continuously operating the service as is, uh, supporting users that are, that like to use either the central uh, and mass service. Uh, Operated by by Jean Project, or even install their their own service uh, on top of their own Kubernetes um, installation, and we have uh, one case uh, like that as well. And yeah, so this is all from my side. Thank you. And Johan, David, do you want to more or less tell us what's what stage that you feel you are, and what are the foreseen mm -hmm. timelines and features? Um, yeah, I think we're the state for us is we're we're in good shape for Arista support, but we want to work on uh, having better support for uh, firstly Juniper equipment. So we have some Juniper things in our lab now, um, and we we know there are some things we we need to at least improve a bit uh, for it to be. Uh, comfortable uh, to use it with Juniper um, and for Cisco as well we we don't have any Cisco equipment in the lab at the moment but uh, we want to have support for, for Cisco equipment as well uh, so I think that's the the current uh, development um, and also the, the last uh, you know months it's been uh, some development on the the web user interface uh, and other like support systems um, we have some work on authentication and yeah integration with uh, federated logins and stuff like that to to work on as well we were using using jwt some kind of javascript tokens for authentication and we also want to provide some uh, some uh, better federated login that can issue those tokens for authentication. Okay, thank you. And Nikos, do you want to tell us more or less? Uh, we are currently working on uh, on version tracking. We and. Uh, in order to provide uh, a tool for uh, for users to check uh, the most recent version of Wi-Fi Mom, apart for require regarding the equipment that I heard before, uh, we do not uh, we are not uh, constrained to particular equipment. Uh, also, I mentioned about uh, Raspberry Pi, but you can use any uh, any device as a hardware pro. And I think I also you the question was also about the security of the code. Right. Uh, we recently worked with Work Package Nine. They assessed our code, and we made some uh, some improvements improvements based on their results. And we're currently enforcing their practices uh, on our own until the next probably code assessment round. Thank you, Nikos. I saw Dimitris uh, raise uh, his hand. Dimitris, do you want to ask anything? Yes. Um... 
my question was uh, with regard to the, to Argus. So does Argus support any kind of um, uh, time uh, series um, aggregation in terms of the, um, of the events? Or does it store the whole um, um, time series events uh, without uh, doing any kind of aggregation? So uh, Argus is not really concerned with time series data at all. It's just concerned with the, the concept of incidents. So uh, for, for time series data or details about the incidents, you would uh, click the uh, details link on an incident to drill back into the originating source system. I see. OK, thank you. Thank you, Morten. And thank you, Dimitris. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, Johan, you mentioned now that the, the authentication authorization for for your program, and I was wondering, as it's something that we are offering for campus network management as a service, is it possible to have like shared uh, management of a platform, or if you sh if you configure the equipment, is only you and not the institution who can do that? Um, yeah. So for for our customers at Sunet, it's very much a collaboration where both uh, Sunet. The, the NOC and our network engineering at Sunet works together with the, the with the network engineers at the local campus. So uh, it's uh, very important for us to be able to uh, yeah, allow logins from from uh, multiple organizations like that. But uh, today, it's we have to create uh, local accounts for. Uh, this NMS instance. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, so I would like to thank all the speakers for the presentations. I think it was a very interesting and technical information today. Let me remind you that you can find all the information of the of this info share in the in the website in the events page. Let me just show it it's let me check I, i'm going to share it i have some problems sharing things today since it seems it's not my best day <laughs> but let me check if i can do it um here it is i guess you see my screen now yes uh, thank you Okay, so what we have here is a program, but in the agenda, in the events page that you that you can link from this uh, slide, you have all the presentations on, on the website. And I would also like to show you what are the next uh, events that you can see. Let me just show this. We have the TNC, of course, in June, and around TNC, there are two BOFs that are related to orchestration, automation, and virtualization. Somehow, we have a BOF the same week of the TNC uh, for orchestration, automation, and virtualization. So if you would like to participate or you would like to present or, or participate in the discussion, please let us know, and, and we, we will be there to, to see how we are going to develop new new possibilities for orchestration or automation and virtualization or OAV for short. And then we have also a P4 and data plane programming both on the 18th June also tied to the TNC program. And if you want to give more ideas for more info shares or more uh, ideas for the, the things we have spoken today, just let us know too. I see one question, but I'm not sure <laughs> it will. It, uh, we get info on what model of motorbike Johan is riding. Okay, and jokes uh, other than that, I think that uh, we are mostly almost done. Uh, is there any other question you want to ask to our speakers? If not, thank you very much all for joining and sorry for the mess with the link and the password at the beginning. I'm really, really sorry. Apologies for that. Thanks for being here and see you in the next info share. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.